Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is View from the North, that means Canada. And we're going to examine Canadian income tax today and compare it with U.S. income tax. And the bottom line is, is it cheaper than U.S. income tax? Is it different? Uh, let's find out from Ken Rogers, Dr. Ken Rogers in Kelowna, B.C., who is a retired Canadian businessman and uh, well-trained in this area. Welcome to the show, Ken. Uh, hello, Jay. And uh, I don't know if one would use well-trained. I have a, a limited exposure. You know, income tax in particular is so complex that I think it's virtually impossible for anybody to be an expert in in the whole the whole bag. Uh, you know, the, the problem is that if you were well trained in the in the early '60s when you and I met, um, so much has happened. It's changed so many times. So many provisions. Sometimes you know changes that are 180 changes that are profound. So if you want to stay current in tax, you have to study it every single day. So I take your point, okay? <laughs> but let's look at let's look at the conceptual thing here. The conceptual thing is you have a, an income tax system in Canada. Canada, so logistically, is very much like the U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, economics and uh, you know and, and fiscal policy. Um, but certainly, I would expect the Canadian tax system to be different. So let's talk about the touch points that you know you're concerned with in Canada and try to compare them with the touch points we are concerned with the U.S. Well, <clears throat> I think we need a couple of generalizations. First, uh, you know, one is that Canada and the U.S. have pretty similar taxation policies from top to bottom. And by taxation, it's not just income tax. You know, if you take an excise tax, you know, what's the difference? You know, you're, you're paying it in the bottom line or for the economics of the individual uh, citizen. Now, um, the first thing that both Canada and the U.S. have in common in terms of their income tax code is that they are so absurdly complex that that is really um, violates any conceptual principle of what would make a good tax system. Yeah, and let, let me add one other thing. Not only are they complex, but they are political. You know, for example, the Section 1245 in the Internal Revenue Code, um, or was it 1250? One of those right around there, which uh, allows for uh, accelerated depreciation of elevators and escalators. And you say, why? Why do we have accelerated depreciation as a benefit to the taxpayer of elevators and escalators? And the answer in one of my classes at NYU was, well, it's not, it's not complicated. It's political. It's because the elevator and escalator industry lobbied it to get this benefit. So, you know, you say it's complex, but don't assume that it's rational. It's largely political. I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, that, that's a great example. Um, you know, a, a Canadian equivalent one, and which would give the, the reasoning for it you know, is why is it still in the tax code? You see, it may have been originally put in because, you know, a, a lot of these European countries were building five and six story buildings that were all walk up. You know, well, gee, an elevator is a great thing to encourage. <laughs> an escalator is a great thing to encourage. Uh, you know, you're you're trying to modernize. Well, for example, in Canada, you know, but you may say, why is it left in the tax act if that was the reason for putting it in well in canada we got examples like that you know some whether it was 80 or 100 years ago they put in the tax code that um, you know if you build a building let's call it a, a warehouse or an office suburban warehouse building or an office building and you put in underground pipes so you can have plumbing you know you could have an indoor toilet you you get special deduction for that underground pipe you know and similarly if you landscape the property because you know you came out of the dust bowl you you really had you know let's try to make it at least reasonable for the employees and the neighbors well why is that crap still left in the tax code 
you know, in in Canada, it still is. Uh, and and I can remember, you know, you when you get those esoteric pieces, very much like the U.S. tax code. I can remember figuring out um, back in, uh, you know, from between 1960 and 1980, that uh, how if we built a a townhouse project, you had an awful lot of underground utilities and and an awful lot of landscaping, but we figured out how we could get investors to come in, some a dentist or somebody like that, and enable them to get that deduction against their income. Now, the US is very similar to Canada in having all kinds of little tidbits in, the ta in that complicated tax act that enable anybody with a lot of money to get an awful lot of deductions. Like one major difference between Canada and the US is we have what's called an alternate minimum tax, hmm. you know, to, to sort of stand back and say, if you're a, a poor person in Canada, you have a uh, lower tax burden, income tax burden than an American with a low income. If you're a very high income uh, earner in Canada versus the US, you know, the uh, American rich guy's way better off because Canada has this thing called an alternate minimum tax. Uh, a, a lot of the stuff that Elizabeth Warren said when she was trying to run uh, to um, be the uh, presidential candidate back when Biden first won it. Uh, you know, she had the idea that, you know, if wealthy people only paid, you know, 15 percent, they could, the U.S. could do all kinds of things. Now, one of the biggest differences between Canada and the U.S. is uh, federal versus provincial. That is, in Canada, the federal government has way less authority and money than the U.S. federal government. You know, for example, uh, the U.S. Um, <clears throat> federal government uh, expenditures are about, uh, oh, I got the numbers here somewhere. Um, let me get there. Um, about six and a half trillion dollars, which is about 20% of gross domestic product. Well, in Canada, the federal government um, budget is only 14% of gross domestic product. Now, it's not because the Canadian government isn't doing anything or, or because we have less taxes or less government services. It's just, it, it, it spoils some of the comparisons when you talk only one kind of tax. If you only talk about what is the income tax rate? You know, for example, in Canada, the highest tax rate for an individual is 33%. You know, the highest bracket in the U.S., I think, is 37. Now, that's federal. Oh, but what about the prov provinces? Well, in Canada, the provinces operate very differently than they do in the states. Uh, for example, in um, in Washington State or Alaska, the the state has no statewide income tax. Mm -hmm. Well, British Columbia, that's next door to Washington State and Alaska, um, has about um, twelve percent. You know, the you just get a a, a major difference. Um, you know, similarly, you'll have. Um, you know, what, what's the difference between the effect to an individual of sales taxes? You know, if, you, if you're going to have a, the simplest sale, type of sales tax is an excise tax, you know, put on tobacco or liquor, and how much do you put on? But how many products do you isolate and put that on to? Um, so you get um, a complexity that's, you know, just beyond comprehension for any normal person. <laughs> well, it allows for loopholes. It allows for 
and you know acts acts abuse, if you will. <clears throat> it, it you know it's a, it's a it's a bastion of support for the accounting industry, um, and um, it it sucks up your time to try to figure out how to navigate through all this complexity. And and when we sit here, you and me, and we talk about this, you know, we find that there's a lot of uh, you know a lot of a lot of similarity, at least in the ultimate effect. Of, the, of tax policy and tax requirements uh, in Canada and the U.S., you know, I would imagine uh, that um, that the U.S. that the U.S. pays more. The individual taxpayer pays more uh, simply because there's so many other there's so many taxes, and Canada has got more humane policy. On the other hand, I I would say that this is ridiculous, and and you suggest that because. Um, why do we need to have these multiple taxes, multiple layers of taxes, um, and multiple loopholes that come out of all of that? Um, why can't we just have one system of taxation? I think in Scandinavia they have that. Um, and I remember that corporations, uh, this is before the, the turnover in Hong Kong, you paid 10% flat. It was very simple. Um, we don't have simple. And uh, not only we have complex, but we have complex that isn't fair. Um, sure. So we, you know, the problem is politically, it's very hard to tell a guy who's in the, the 1%, hey, we're going to take away all your benefits. Uh, so how about joining us in a big sweeping reform? They'd never do that. And so we're stuck in this kind of political netherland, which is part of democracy, I suppose, is part of a federal system where the problems never get resolved, and it just gets more and more complicated. Um, what do you think about a flat tax? Um, what do you think about a guaranteed minimum income, like Andrew Yang said when he ran for president? What do you think about simplifying this so that um, the federal government dictates the policy um, and, the, and the provinces or the states do not? Um, and, and how do you reconcile um, the, the sales tax or the excise tax as against the property tax, as against the estate tax, uh, so many taxes, and the income tax. It's, you know, really, you have to have a PhD just to figure out what forms to file. Well, you forgot a few. You know, you've got to have import duties. <laughs> Thank you. You've got to have resource royalties. You know, for example, the province of Alberta has lower taxes. That's the big image. Well, it depends whether you're in the oil industry or not. You know, you pay humongous royalties so that they don't have to have any other taxes. Like they, they're the only province in Canada that has no provincial income ta or no um, uh, provincial um, sales tax, um, where BC has 12%. Um, now you've got... Uh, from paychecks in Canada, there are things like somebody might have their union fees deducted from paycheck. Well, you have a Canada pension plan, like Canada has a national pension plan system. It's really, really nifty and it's efficient and it enables people to switch job without losing pensions and not ending up on welfare at the end or poverty. Uh, but that doesn't count as income tax. It's just another tax out there, you know, comes off the paycheck and you got to, uh, the Canadian healthcare system, you know, is pretty terrific, but much of it is paid for just from a payroll deduction rather than something else. And, you know, and then you get, if your income's low enough, you don't have to pay that, but you get the healthcare anyhow. Well, that doesn't show in a lot of other places adding to the complexity. But this, um, uh, on your question of what's fair, you know, I take um, what's fair, a rich guy may say the 10% from everybody is a great answer. You know, if you're going to force them to pay anything anyhow, um, they'd say, well, that's the most fair route, where I think that fair ha must have a progressive scale in it. You know, the person who can pay more should pay more. You know, that 
the guy at the bottom of the rung shouldn't pay anything. You know, I agree. To... I wouldn't. You know, it's the old thing about regressive and and uh, progressive taxes. And uh, I, I want to add that in Hawaii, this um, this session of the legislature, finally after five years of lobbying, um, they excluded uh, medical fees. Uh, from the um, gross excise tax, which is four percent, with a kicker on top, um, and so uh, you know what is what is really mm, sort of troubling about that is that yeah, the doctors um, got an exemption from the gross excise tax. What about the rest of us? Um, you you know you have so many worthy social expenses you have to pay, and they're still taxable. The state of Hawaii has had a, a stream of tax directors who have lobbied. To include the gross excise tax on everything. And it's regressive. The poor guy pays a larger share you know, of his available income to this gross excise tax. The rich guy, he doesn't have the same problem. So, I mean, tax policy is in a cockpit as far as I'm concerned. But what's worse is the Tax Reform Act that Trump engineered in the January of 2017. <laughs> Right after he got, you know, in office, him and Paul Ryan engineered this, um, you know, sneaky bill. They called it tax reform. It wasn't tax reform at all. It reformed taxes for the rich guys, but not so much for the, the small guys. And uh, the rich guys still have the benefits, but the benefits for the small guys have largely expired already. Um, and, you know, and, and Congress did that without any hearings, without any economic analysis. It was strictly political. So the problem is you have to have a, a government that is not strictly political, that cares about the welfare of its citizens, that cares about equity in, ter in terms of taxation. Um, and if you, is, I'm arguing against my own point here, and if you allow the federal government to make those decisions, you're really asking for a political answer that has profound leverage on everyone. Um, if you allow it to go province by province, at least, you know, you don't get this monolithic and sometimes uh, profoundly erroneous decision making at, at the federal government. So um, that's what we have, though, because Congress get, is highly politicized. We get erroneous decisions at every level. <laughs> you, know, it's, uh, you know, it's not, uh, you know, a Canadian private specialty, you know, and we can notice that in all kinds of places across the border. Um, you know, but when you stand back, you know, the, you know, level of taxation that everybody has is a major complaint. And the key, the key thing that Canada and the U.S. both have in common is the wealthy do not pay a fair share or a just share. You know, they, they may, it's too close to the, you know, everybody pays $10 and that's it. You know, like I, you know, when I was uh, back in many days as a real estate developer, uh, you know, I used to have no, you know, reasonable income, but paid no personal income tax. You know, well, my complaint was I paid enough property tax to cover, you know, the average of, you know, maybe 50 people's income tax. So what do you mean I don't pay tax? You know, it, it's a matter of, and a wealthy person can always have access to the politician. And yes. they can persuade the politicians. And the poor guy never gets his story in there. You know, yes. you, you, you well, don't, don't see forget, too don't many. Forget. You don't see too many politicians in the world like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, even though, you know, I think Bernie's a bit too far left for what's good for the Democratic Party and winning an election. He could he could do well in Canada, but, uh, you know, because we seem to be more uh, accepted, acceptance of the idea that the wealthy should pay more and we're going to force it that way, you know, and, and we don't have a Citizens United kind of, you know, court ruling that so big money cannot doodle with Canadian elections. And that's a major problem with the U.S. and 
and why your tax structure will probably be less fair tomorrow than it is today, and ours will get a little fairer as we go along. I'm you know, such as this alternate alternate minimum tax, where the yeah. you know the wealthiest person has, it's almost like they have to fill in two tax returns. You know, they fill it in the same way you and I do. And then there's a second list that has a whole bunch of things that we don't care about any exemptions, anything else. Just give us how much cash did you get? And we want 15% of it. I mean, it, it's not quite that simple. And that's just going to be raised to 20%. Um, well, you know, the Internal Revenue Service, uh, I think they have some kind of parallel to the alternate minimum tax. But um, the, the is, is this year... You're able to file, thanks to the Biden administration, you're able to file directly with the Internal Revenue Service. Okay, and that means you don't have to go to a tax preparer, spend that money, sometimes it's a lot of money, having somebody prepare your tax return. And, and they'll work with you, they'll talk to you. Um, this is a good thing, uh, and people really like that. But you know, what I get out of this whole affair is that if you're rich, not only can you lobby for tax structures that favor you. But you can go to a lawyer or an accountant and he can find or she can find loopholes for you. And the result is that, you know, Donald Trump paid very little tax over the course of his, you know, time, even, even while he was in office. Um, and also he uh, evalu evaluated his, the value of his property uh, as higher or lower, depending on how that would work from a tax point of view. And we know from the decision in court uh, from Judge Engeron that, gee whiz, that, that means a lot. It's a big difference if you value your property erroneously, intentionally. Um, you can save tons and tons of money. He came out with uh, $450,000 um, different. Uh, you got to add a few zeros sorry. to that. A yeah, million dollars. <laughs> so what I'm saying is there are loopholes out there that the rich guy can afford to take advantage of, and there's a whole industry of lawyers and accountants that will help him do that. This is not. This makes it even further from equity. It makes it less fair. So I think there are a lot of people out there that that do this, and not only you know do they, you know, not pay the same rates. But their preparation of their tax returns are way different, way more sophisticated, way more loophole-oriented uh, than, than the poor guy. And finally, there's the estate tax, you know, starting with, uh, I guess it was before George W. Bush. Um, they essentially knocked that off so that you could, you know, they, they changed the exemptions and all so that you could essentially leave a large estate to your family, passing your wealth down from generation to generation in this kind of dynastic way um, without, without ever having to pay tax. And, you know, this is also troubling because not only do you, do you have a, a lower tax burden per, per capita um, and per progressive point of view during your life uh, or your corporate life, but you can pass this wealth down and you're sons and daughters and grandchildren and whatnot can do the same thing. And this separates, this is the, what do you want to call it, the tax divide in the U.S. And I suggest you probably have the same thing, but it's, it's not as troublesome in Canada. It's exactly the same. Yeah. You know, it's just like you've got uh, <clears throat> more rules and, and it's more difficult in Canada, but the substance of it, you know, the wealthy person can create a structure whereby, you know, there's the pass me downs are fairly sizable and, and, you know, you get the generation, family generations of wealthy. And so you get, um, you know, like, uh, you know, Justin Trudeau, our prime minister, you know, born with a golden spoon and, you know, sort of like a, you know, Rockefeller, you know, well, at least the Rockefeller that was a governor in New York, I thought he did a good job, but you know, as opposed to, I don't think Trudeau did, you know. Yeah. So we have, we have a problem, Houston, um, and uh, I don't see an easy solution for it. Um, and uh, I suppose uh, if you were an activist 
uh, let's let's make you a democratic activist representing the 99%, what would you do? Because Congress is beyond reach these days, um, and we're not going to see any true reform there. I'm afraid um, that's the sort of beyond the pale. Um, the only place you can get reform, really, is in the state legislature, uh, where you can adjust and adapt for what they do in Congress and give people a break uh, on the state level. It's never, never going to really compensate for what the, what the Fed is going to do, but at least it's some relief. Um, and, you know, and I also, not to get too far afield here, but I also am concerned about this variation in the sales tax and gross excise tax. If, if you live in, um, I think it's Oregon, you don't pay any sales tax. But if you live in the state of Washington, you do. So what people do is they live in Washington uh, and they go to Oregon and well, they shop in Oregon. You, you've got, you know, Portland is, straddles the Columbia River and about a quarter of it is in the Washington state side. Well, of course, you'd go across the border to do it. You've got all kinds of those in, in, in everywhere in the world. You know, in Canada, there's a, a city in, on the border between Alberta and Saskatchewan. You know, and Saskatchewan has much better social policies. So everybody lives in the Saskatchewan side, and then they drive across into Alberta and work, and you have the higher pay. <laughs> you know, it's it's and, yeah, and, I, I and know the lower income tax. <laughs> I know, I know, it's uh, this is it's everywhere, um, but it just doesn't seem right to me um, to do that. And 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 frankly, um, if there was a um, logical, rational caring federal government, I would leave it in the hands of the federal government. And well, I why would you, have all the... like a, an item that, you know, the various times that I lived in the United States, I did not think so negatively about Congress as you seem to be coming across. You know, for example, in Canada, you know, I am not a super fan of the efficiency of the Canadian federal parliament but it does work and they do things and they're willing to push controversial things you know for example uh, we had a uh, budget just uh, you know a couple weeks ago in which they uh, went to one of the sacred cows of the of the wealthy tax loophole users and that was um, uh, capital gains you know, in Canada, the, as in the U.S., capital gains had a lesser tax treatment, you know, on the excuse that, well, gee, the, the corporation already paid some tax, so why should I pay any? You know, well, you know, much like the dividend ex excuse, you know, but capital gains are different than dividends because if the corporate tax rate, you know, is you know, 20% or something that that corporation pays, well, then if you just stood back and took that amount of income, how much did, did all levels of government get out get out of that much um, income? You know, whether it was kept in the corporation and eventually showed up as a capital gain or it was paid out as a dividend. Well, this budget increased this um, capital gain tax from, uh, a quarter, or l let's say you pay tax on um, on fifty percent of a capital gain, and they ch changed it to two thirds. Um, and uh, boy, there's you should That's hear the cries. Change. You should yeah. hear the cries from like the hedge fund managers and the kind of guys who's, you know, that all they play with is capital gains and and you know paper. They don't produce anything whatsoever. They're just you know, paper shufflers for big bucks. It's going to become more and more like that, isn't it? I mean, it has gotten, it's incredibly complex. And the only guys uh, that can figure it out are the ones who, who play that game with the uh, money managers. So and then I'm, I'm, I'm wondering uh, whether we're on the right track for this. And, um, and I'm wondering whether it's uh, ultimately going to be fair or collapse. And the problem is, that you have to have public confidence. 
And right now, you know, I don't think you have that much public confidence in the tax system or the Internal Revenue Service. And, and I think that's an issue waiting to happen politically, where people rise up with pitchforks and say, no, 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 it can't be like this. And then on top of that, Ken, you have the story of James Comey, the former head of the uh, FBI. When he fell out of favor with Trump during the Trump administration, Trump caused the Internal Revenue Service to audit him over and over and over again. Pure political harassment. Now, it's not like shooting him on the street or causing the intelligence agency to assassinate him. I think these days close. you might try that. He's close. <laughs> and, and, and there were others, too. It wasn't just Comey. So I'm saying to myself, um, you know, if Trump gets back into office, that's what's going to happen. You know, anyone who complains about him and criticizes him is, 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 is in line for an audit, a really mean audit, an audit that takes a, you know, a lot of time and money away from him, and an audit that could ruin his life. And so all of a sudden you say, gee, can I trust the Internal Revenue Service? Uh, or is it simply a political instrument of whoever the president is? So that, that's a further loss of confidence. You know, well, can't have government where people are not confident. Well, you know, confidence in people, you know, do, do you not have enough confidence in your fellow Americans to recognize what a problem Donald Trump is and would be? And, and I mean, I can't believe he's even the candidate. You want, you want the short answer? No, I do not have that confidence. But let me ask you about Europe. You know, I, I, I wonder about, for example, Scandinavia. I, my recollection is Scandinavia has a, a pretty high rate, okay, but a simple structure. Do you know anything about what happens in Scandinavia? Yeah, um, they have a um, higher standard of living now than the United States does, especially Norway, you know, because Norway has a fair slug of oil, but it's not as if the United States was not gifted with resources. You know, I mean, the mm -hmm. United States produces more oil than Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're doing more liquid natural gas than anybody in the world, even if a lot of it's Canadian gas. <laughs> but, yeah. that's, that's okay, we like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think uh, you've got to have, like you say, what, what could be a solution, an academic solution is if you have a leader like John F. Kennedy and you give him an excuse like suddenly the Russians put up Sputnik and so he comes out with, we shall, you know, make it to the moon in 10 years and we are going to have a grandiose and are you with me? And everybody's with them, okay? And you've got to have, you know, the Income Tax Act. If you listen to when they were running for president, people like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders says how abusive the tax system is, how the wealthy aren't paying their share and so on. And you, you just get a few excuses and you get somebody with the charisma and, and, and talent of JFK to present you know, we have to rewrite the tax structure from top to bottom. And that really is it. And and if you really have, you know, the Scandinavian countries kind of did it at an inch at a time, but they were also more socialistically inclined than the U.S. Like in, in the rest of the world, you know, having something that's socially good is not a swear word. You know, in the United States, it's, you know, the Democrats, or at least the Republicans, seem to make out that uh, any move to do anything is putting us into, you know, pure socialism. You know, goodness, we're going to be communists next week if you keep doing that. Um, and it's just not so. I mean, you know, the, the health care system in the U.S. where some, uh, you know, lots of people go bankrupt because they get some surprise illness. That doesn't happen in most of the world. You know, how can hmm. Americans be that stupid? Or the well, you know what, what you raise an interesting, <laughs> an interesting point, and that is we've been talking about the comparison of the tax systems, and there are multiple tax systems both in the U.S. and Canada. 
and they don't really work well together and they don't provide an equitable result or, or a quality of economic life to the individual taxpayer and citizen. But, you know, to reform, you must also have better fiscal policy. And I think we worry about that. As you say, the, Re the Republicans, they don't want to tax. They want all the rich people to be richer. Um, and they don't want to spend because they don't want to help the social safety net. They want everybody to be on his own. And if you, if you want to have a good life, then you have to work for it. And too bad for you if you don't, if you don't achieve wealth. Um, but, you know, the, at the end of the day, the government has a role to help everyone and to help everyone in equitable measure. And I suggest to you that some of these Scandinavian countries, that's high on the priority. We're going to do government as a service to people. We're going to take care of people. And, and maybe all through Europe, or at least a good part of Western Europe, the same notion. But, but in the U.S., we have problems with fiscal policy. Well, when you get the money, we... When we get the money, we don't know exactly how to spend it or not. Well, the, well, the, the big infrastructure bill, you know, uh, along with the CHIPS Act, to me are the reasons why the U.S. economy is better than any other country, one in the world right now. Like, they're, you know, uh, m much of Europe is really in recession mode. Canada's right in the borderline, um, you know, despite the fact that uh, there's too much inflation everywhere. You know, but that fiscal policy, you know, the timing was not perfect. That is, it should have been, if you could have done it earlier, you would have avoided an awful lot of the COVID mess, you know. But, you know, you say, well, how do you do some of these infrastructure projects during COVID? Well, well that's not too tough, you know. Mm. You know, um, I talk about confidence uh, in the tax system. But we also have to have confidence in the government in general. And so um, if I'm to write a check to the IRS and all that, I would like to know that my money is going to the right place. And sometimes, you know, you see, at least in this country, where you're pretty convinced it's not going to the right place. And, and you know, you, you know, you have trouble writing the check, but you do. You write the I, check. I think that I think that's an unfair assessment of your own country. You know, as I th think generally, um, governments have delivered, um, and uh, <clears throat> I think that it's uh, perhaps a, an American mode to always uh, say, you know, whoever's in charge is doing a lousy job, you know, and and so every you usually give every president a second chance, but for sure you vote out the party every second term I, I mean it's almost like an automatic um uh, you know the canadians grumble about the about government but they really have faith and belief that the governments are important and and certainly in europe it's even stronger yeah what about the, the notion of uh, of printing money spending and spending and spending without any regard to you know, the, the downline effect of that. Billions well, and trillions and more trillions. Um, can the United States keep on doing that? Does the United States have tax receipts that balance that? Or are we just digging a hole? And, and when is Judgment Day? Well, one of the things I found was um, the, um, United, the United States has averaged a deficit equal to 3% of GDP for the last 50 years. Now, a lot of that is because the U.S. dollar is a reserve currency, and the U.S. has been able to get away with it. Um, you know, no, no other country in the world has done that. I mean, people that try it for a couple of years end up like Argentina, you know, right now with a, a you know, super inflation and, you know, and it's just gone insane. The currency's done done in. The whole economy's collapsing, despite the fact that they have highly educated people and highly skilled people. They just, you know, can't get their government fiscal policy in 
and uh, monetary policy to work together. Now, well, they, they've had their judgment day then, but what about us? Aren't we bound for a judgment day too? Why? <laughs> well, as you say, uh, the U.S. can spend all this money and, quote, get away with it. That means that people support spending all this money, even though our ballot, our budget is not at all balanced. And I guess the, the question is, where, if you lose confidence in that, if you say, wait a minute, the emperor is not wearing clothes here. We can't do this anymore. And there's an uprising, I mean, a, a, a sort of a crisis of public confidence. That sounds to me like Judgment Day. Well, you've had, you know, fairly quick change in U.S. Congress uh, in the last couple of years, you know, going from a, a sensible, conservative, um, you know, Liz Cheney uh, kind of level of intelligence uh, for a, for half of the politicians in, in Washington to the insane uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene kind of uh, people or Donald Trump kind of person, just stupidity. Um, well, you you really you have the person who says I'm unhappy with something. Why do you vote for those kind of idiots? You know, you you get what you deserve. I agree. And and um, you know you you got to value voting and treat it, you know, with enough respect that you get people that are worth having in in office. Have them in office, like. Uh, you know, the nearest governor in the U.S. to where I live, uh, Governor Inslee in Washington State. I mean, you should dream to have him anywhere. You know, he's leaving. About, he, he I know, know he leaving. is. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, he could easily win again. You know, I think he's won three times in a row. And every time he runs, he gets a higher percentage of the total vote. <laughs> and And even though, you know, Washington State's a bit unusual because the the eastern end of Washington State, you know, a fairly large city called Spokane, that's really close to the border of Idaho. In fact, metropolitan Spokane, about a, a quarter of it is in Idaho. You know, well, that is about the most conservative redneck part of the United States. I mean, it, it really is um, you know, at the end of the earth. So it's surprising that anybody could get a majority in Washington, you know, steadily. I mean, I could say, thank goodness, the Seattle end of the state has way, way more people <laughs> than the Spokane end of the state. <laughs> well, you know, it seems to me that uh, we've identified um, a problem of complexity, a problem of uh, the in enforce enforcement. Um, a problem of, um, you know, industries, uh, uh, financial industries seeking loopholes, uh, problems of lobbying. And it needs reform. It needs reform in both places. But in democracies, it's hard to achieve reform. And I also think your last point about Inslee is, is really critical. And that is, you, you have to have leadership for reform. You must have somebody who will speak out and speak up and come up with rational ways to achieve reform in a democratic society. And so we need to look for leaders who will lead the country, lead Congress, lead the White House, but also all the state legislatures and all the governors. And, and that's what we ought to you know, try to achieve in our votes. And that should be a platform point of, for everybody who runs for office, don't you think? Yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> You know, you, you need the, the Inslees, you know, firstly, to have the respect of government. You know, like, you know, that's a difference between you and I. I have considerable respect for the level, for the various levels of government in Canada, even though I obviously dislike the current prime minister and think that he's a very poor choice for the, for that party to pick as a leader. Uh, but. Um, uh, you know, nevertheless, I, that doesn't mean that I don't think the federal government is a failure. Um, the, um, <clears throat> you know, the, and the United States has tried to have a structure that would 
insulate, you know, the Federal Reserve from, you know, the government, but Trump wants to take over the Federal Reserve. Similarly, you know, the tax department has traditionally, and the Justice Department traditionally, uh, you know, been sacred cows that, that any reasonable um, president doesn't doodle with them. You know, they'll ask, would you like legislation? What could be useful? And try to cooperate with them, not command them to do an audit of your enemies. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, you you know, it's it's really a leadership question. You know, mm, we and, agree. And, and Americans agree. have, I mean, you've got some of the brightest, most capable people in the world. Uh, you've got to figure out how to use them. And, and one of your... Nifty features is is when you have a, a president, the president gets to pick the cabinet. You know, so you can you can pick somebody like Lee Iacocca if you want somebody with a talent in a particular area, or you can, you know, find a Jay Inslee or or you know, the um <clears throat> you know, and a couple of the cabinet ministers now in the US have got that high quality feature to them but uh, yeah. you know in canada your your cabinet minister is really somebody who was elected in that party you know so that you know let's say the canadian federal government has a, a liberal party they only won about a third of the vote but like israel we have a a coalition government combining a couple of parties and so the one of the of the parties that are in the combination which one had the most members and they get to put their leader in charge and he gets to then pick who's in the cabinet you know with the you know um you know some input from the coalition players you know and getting about the same mess that israel's got but well it's a it's it's all linked isn't it and it's linked to government it's linked to the society it's linked to public opinion uh, it's it's linked to leaders or non-leaders. Uh, we got to go now, Ken. Thank you very much for this discussion. Very valuable discussion. It, it went to in in way beyond just a comparative analysis of the tax system or the income tax systems of the. Well, two they're countries. both a mess. How do you <laughs> say no. whose mess is worse? <laughs> it's all connected. It's all connected, and that's the lesson of this of this discussion. Thank yes. you so much, Ken Rogers. Tired Canadian businessman. Thank you very much. Aloha from Canada. <laughs> Aloha too. <laughs>